In this video, we'll talk about the differential diagnosis of neurological thoracic outlet syndrome, cervical radicular syndrome, and peripheral nerve entrapment. Enroll in our online course now. Link is in the video description. Hi, and welcome back to Physio Tutors. The physical examination of thoracic outlet syndrome, abbreviated as TOS, is frequently long and complex as the clinician needs to examine the entire upper limb and cervical spine. Not only is a neurological examination required, but frequently peripheral nerve entrapment tests also need to be performed. In a substantial number of patients initially diagnosed with TOS, either radiculopathy or neuropathy is the eventual diagnosis. In more than 60% of patients referred to vascular surgeons for a TOS surgery, an alternative diagnosis was established. So the diagnosis of TOS should be only considered after the exclusion of cervical radicular syndrome and peripheral neuropathy. If you are unsure how to diagnose cervical radicular syndrome and how to distinguish it from peripheral nerve entrapment, we'd like to refer you to an earlier video we've published that you can watch by a click in the top right corner. All right, so let's now look at different features that distinguish neurological TOS from the other two diagnoses. In neurological TOS, we can observe a compression of either the lower plexus or the upper brachial plexus. The lower plexus originates from the spinal nerve roots C8 and T1 and is often described to be compressed by a cervical rib or fibrous band from an elongated C7 transverse process. The upper plexus contains spinal nerves C5 till C7 and is believed to be compressed most often within the Scalene triangle. In reality, 85 to 90% of cases of neurological TOS may present with a combination of upper and lower plexus involvement. Keeping in mind that the symptoms of brachial plexus compression are more widespread due to the involvement of several individual nerves will help us to distinguish this pattern from cervical radicular syndrome and entrapment neuropathies in which only one spinal nerve or only one peripheral nerve is involved. In contrast to cervical radicular syndrome in which patients experience shooting pain down the arm and often the medial border of the scapula, there is little or no neck pain in TOS and vertex compression and lateral bending do not cause radicular pain. If the lower plexus is involved in TOS, patients often report mild, deep aching pain in the ulnar forearm and hand, as well as the axillary and anterior shoulder region. In upper plexus compression, the symptomatology is often suprascapular with radiation to the chest, periscapular region and the head and in the distribution of the radial nerve. In general, pain in TOS tends to be poorly localized, does not follow a dermatomal or peripheral nerve distribution and is worsened by prolonged arm elevation or heavy work. Pain and tenderness in median and ulnar neuropathy is usually present at the site of nerve compression, while paresthesia is seen distal to the site of compression along the distribution of the nerve. Provocation in ulnar neuropathy due to cubital tunnel compression is often reported upon using the involved limb and upon elbow flexion, while pain and paresthesia and carpal tunnel syndrome is provoked by maximal wrist flexion and extension. Sensory loss. The sensory axons in the lower brachial plexus supply the ulnar side of the hand and the medial side of the forearm. So there is sensory disturbance in the medial forearm and the fourth and fifth finger, but the ring finger is not split like in ulnar neuropathy, where the radial side is spared as it is innervated by the median nerve. In ulnar neuropathy, and radiculopathy of C8, sensory loss will also be limited to the hand and not be present in the medial forearm. The sensory axons in the upper brachial plexus 
supply the medial side of the upper arm, forearm and the radial three digits. In median nerve entrapment, only the hand with the radial three and half digits shows decreased sensation, while cervical radiculopathy of C6 results in diminished sensation of the thumb and index finger. And cervical radiculopathy of C7 only affects the middle finger. For more information on dermatome testing for the upper limb, you can find a video by a click on the info button in the top right corner. In most cases of neurological toss, there will be no loss of motor function, but often vasomotor changes such as rubber or blanching are common. In more severe cases, upper brachial plexus involvement is suggested by weakness and atrophy of the deltoids, biceps and brachialis muscles. Lower plexus entrapment is suspected if patients complain of hand weakness and clumsiness and show atrophy of the thena and hypothena eminences. This is particularly seen in the aviductor pollicis brevis muscle leading to guttering of the thena eminence, which is spared in ulnar neuropathy. In ulnar neuropathy, the hypothena eminence will show atrophy as well as clawing of the ring and small fingers in a distal lesion and an inability to flex in a proximal lesion. The Froman sign shows overt flexion of the thumb into phalangeal joint while attempting resisted pinch. And Wartenberg sign shows a persistent abduction of the pinky. In distal neuropathy of the median nerve from carpal tunnel syndrome, the first two lumbricals, the abductor pollicis brevis and opponent's pollicis will be affected. So a patient might be unable to abduct or oppose the thumb and present with a median claw hand, which is unable to extend the second and third digit. In a proximal lesion, the patient will be unable to flex these fingers. In cervical radiculopathy, weakness is usually partial or incomplete. This is due to the fact that nearly all muscles are innervated by more than one spinal nerve. The partial weakness can then be observed in the myotome of the cervical nerve root. For more information, you can watch a video on the cervical myotomes in the top right corner. On our channel, you can find different special tests which can help you to further in or exclude all of the four conditions. Click on the playlist right next to me to learn more. Okay, this was our video on differential diagnosis for neurological TOS. A lot of this information and much more can be found on our future course on the spine on our website study.physiotutors.com. Of course, we'll be happy if you leave a like and follow our channel. Thanks a lot for watching. This is Kai for Physio Tutors. I'll see you in the next video. Bye.